now stand for the call to worship printed in your bulletin. Sing praises to God, O ye saints, and give thanks to God's holy name. We exalt you, O God, for you have restored us to life. We may cry through the night, but your joy comes with the morning. You hear us, O God, and you are gracious in our distress. You turn our mourning into dancing. Our souls cannot be silent. O God, our Savior, we give thanks to you forever. Let us worship the Lord, the great I Am. holiness. God is light and truth, yet we live among shadows and lies. People of God, let us acknowledge who and whose we are. Let us ask our powerful God to illumine us with grace and truth. Let us pray. Generous God, you equip us with the spirit of courage, but we have been afraid. You send us the spirit of truth, but we cling to our illusions. You gift us with the spirit of healing, but we cannot let go of our hurts. God of forgiveness, come to us again. Shake our hearts. Set our souls on fire with your love. 
Send us out into the world, rejoicing in your power. We hold out to you all our particular burdens of guilt and sin. And we ask for your help to live the way of your justice and love. Amen. God the Creator brings you new life, forgives, forgives and redeems you. Take hold of this forgiveness and live your life in the spirit of Jesus. Friends, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. to come up. I think all of our friends are sleeping this morning. That's okay. Good morning. Good morning. Man, way to be there, Graham. Good job. All right, I have a question for you guys this morning. How many of you guys have ever baked or cooked something? Can you raise your hand if you have? Do you guys want to tell me what you made? Who wants to tell me? Hannah, what would you make? Hannah made cookies, my favorite. Campbell, what did you make? Soup. Mmm. Jerem, what did you make? Chocolate cookies. Hannah's made a lot of stuff. Let me get some other friends. Erin, what did you make? Apple pie. All right. Eliza. Cupcakes. Those sound great. Hannah, go ahead. Tell me. Oh, Emily. Cupcakes. She made cupcakes. Those sound so good, and I'm so hungry right now, too. Listen, how did you guys know how to make that stuff? How did you know? Did you? What directions? Okay, that's good. Graham? Oh, so your mom told you what to do, right? Okay, so we had to listen to our moms, right? And then we had to do what our moms told us to do. That's called following directions, right? So if you didn't listen to your mom or you didn't follow her directions, you go... <laughs> Okay. okay, or your cookies may not taste good either. That's what I was thinking. That, you know, you should follow directions and then our cookies taste better. Well, so in today's story, our story is about Moses. Can you guys say Moses? Moses. Now listen, he had to follow some pretty big instructions. Guess who gave him instructions? God, you guys got that one. That's right. And so God gave him instructions on how to free his people. Do you think he should have paid attention? Do you think he should have listened? Do you think he should have done what God asked him to do? That's right. And he did. And so his people were, ended up being free. But what happened if he didn't listen and follow God's instructions? I know that they may not have been free. They might have picked somebody else for the job. I'm not sure. But just like Moses, we should listen and follow directions too, right? So we can do the things that God wants us to do. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, even if somebody else isn't following the rules, that means you should, Graham. Good point, good point. All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for these children. Thank you for our church. And help us to remember to listen so we can hear what you have called us to do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, if you're going to children's church, let's line up at the door. If not, go sit back with your parent. Please join me in the prayer for illumination printed in your bulletin. God of all creation and newness, bless this place where we would hear your voice. Bless this place where we would hear your story. As we listen, may our ears be attuned to you. As the word is spoken, May you speak to us. May all we hear lead us to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The first Old Testament lesson this morning comes to us from the book of Exodus and can be found on page 50 of your pew Bible. And you are invited to follow along. Beginning with Chapter 2, verse 23. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took notice of them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that, I, that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship the God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. The word of God for the people of God.
Thank you all very much. That was wonderful. The second Old Testament reading is a continuation of the story that Noel began of the conversation between God and Moses about this call that he was receiving. It continues in chapter 4, verses 10 through 17. Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I have never been eloquent neither in the past nor even now that you have spoken to your servant. But I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. But Moses said, O oh my Lord, Please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, What of your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he can speak fluently. Even now he is coming out to meet you, and when he greets you, his heart will be glad. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what you shall do. He indeed shall speak for you to the people. He shall serve as a mouth for you, and you shall serve as God for him. Take in your hand this staff with which you shall perform the signs. May God bless the reading and the hearing of the portions of the word which have been read this morning. love these stories from the Old Testament, but I confess that it is very difficult work 
trying to figure out exactly what these stories have to say to us today. Much ground has been covered both literally and figuratively between last week's story about Jacob and this week's story about Moses. After Jacob had, I'd like to bring you up to date a little bit with what's happened. After Jacob had his dream about that ladder which went to heaven, he went up to Haran, which is in modern day Turkey, where his mother was from. He worked for years for his uncle Laban. He tricked him out of a lot of stuff. He married both of his daughters. And then he went back home to southern Israel to live. He had 12 sons. And like his mother, Rebecca, he played favorites. Joseph was his favorite and received special treatment. So Joseph's brothers despised him and constantly looked for ways that they could do him in. They finally had their opportunity and they sold him to traders who were on their way to Egypt. And they went home and told their father, Jacob, that Joseph had been killed by a wild animal. In the end, Jacob the cheater reaped a bit of the whirlwind. So Joseph ends up a slave in Egypt, but through the blessing of God and an amazing series of events, he ends up second in command to Pharaoh and in charge of preparing for the upcoming seven years of famine which he has foretold. During the famine, His brothers come to Egypt to buy food, and Joseph ends up forgiving them and bringing all of his family to Egypt to live near him. Since they are shepherds, Joseph asked for the territory of Goshen at the mouth of the Nile River for them to live in so that they can graze their sheep there. Eventually, Joseph dies, but his family continues to live there. Generations go and generations come. Pharaohs go and pharaohs come. Joseph's family becomes larger and larger. Eventually, the memory of what Joseph had done for Egypt has been forgotten. The Hebrews continue to live separately from the Egyptians and are regarded as outsiders. There were so many of them that a new pharaoh arose in Egypt who began to regard them with suspicion and fear. He wanted to make sure that they didn't get any uppity ideas about taking over. So he enslaved them and put them to work. They were oppressed and they were treated harshly. But pharaoh decided that even this was not enough. So he told the Hebrew midwives to begin killing any male children who were born to the Hebrew women. The midwives disobeyed this command. They engaged in civil disobedience. But they told a convincing lie about how the Hebrew women were so tough that they didn't need midwives to give birth. So then Pharaoh took the, took the uh, additional step of telling the Egyptian people to all take responsibility by throwing any male Hebrew children they came across into the Nile River to be drowned or to be eaten by crocodiles or hippos. It was during this difficult time that one of the Hebrew women named Jochebed gave birth to Moses. She hid him for three months And then she and her daughter Miriam concocted a plot to undermine Pharaoh's order. They would put Moses in a basket, put him out in the Nile River at the place where Pharaoh's daughter went daily to bathe. And they would count on or hope, pray, that her humanity would override her obedience to her father's decree. And it worked. She brought the baby out of the water and adopted him and raised him as her own. So there's this surprising twist in the story that this Hebrew child, Moses, is raised and educated as a part of Pharaoh's family, spared both death and the slavery endured by his people. When he was 40 years old, according to the book of Acts, he witnessed an act of government brutality as an Egyptian overseer beat a Hebrew slave. And he was appalled by this, and he killed the Egyptian overseer and hid him in the sand. But others had seen what he did, 
And word got to Pharaoh, who issued a death warrant for Moses. Moses quickly fled Egypt, spent the next 40 years living in the land of Midian, where he married a Midianite woman and tended the flocks of his father-in-law. He had a lot of time on his hands there, out in, in the wilderness, tending his flocks, to think about his former life, to think about what he had done, to think about what life was like for his people in Egypt. But that had been a long time ago, and I'm sure he thought that chapter of his life was over and done with. But then came the fateful day when out tending the sheep, he came across a burning bush that was not consumed. The old Pharaoh had died, and God had decided it was time to do something about the, the plight of the enslaved Hebrew people. So God met with Moses there in the burning bush and called him to go back to Egypt and bring the Hebrew people out to their own land where they could live in freedom. Nobody on the face of the earth could have known any better than Moses what an absolutely preposterous job this was that God was giving him. I can imagine him saying to God, to paraphrase Boromir in The Lord of the Rings, one does not just walk into Egypt and say to Pharaoh, I'm going to take your slaves out today. Pharaoh is richer than Croesus. He has a powerful army, chariots, followers who believe that he's God. Who am I that I could possibly accomplish this? This begins that humorous back and forth conversation as God replies, well, it's not just you going. I'm going too. Look, I've got a sign for you. When we get through this job, we're going to come back to this mountain and you'll worship me here. Then it'll all be clear. What kind of sign is that that you don't get until it's all said and done? Then Moses said, well, what do I do if I get there and come to these people and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you? And they say, well, what's his name? God says, my name is I am who I am. Tell them I am has sent you. I have to think God was beating his head. I mean, Moses was beating his head against something by now. I am has sent you? And Moses says, well, what if they don't believe me? And God gave him a couple of magic tricks to do, including a staff that would turn into a snake. Then Moses complains that he's not a very good public speaker and he's not going to be very effective either with the Hebrew slaves or with Pharaoh. God starts to get a little testy with Moses now. Finally, Moses says, paraphrase, paraphrasing now, God, I just really don't want to do this. Please send somebody else. God says, go. I'll send your brother Aaron with you. He's a good spokesman. Go get to work. Finally, Moses was out of objections, so he went, said his goodbyes to his family, and set out for Egypt. The God who calls us also provides the blessings that we're going to need to accomplish the task we've been given. I'm sure that as he started out, Moses felt he had precious little with which to accomplish this enormous task, a promise that he would return to this mountain, a name for God, a staff, and a spokesman. But they were sufficient because God stood behind them all. God didn't give Moses superpowers. He used the flawed human being that was standing before him. God could have lifted up all those slaves into the air and brought them out on angels' wings if God had wanted to. God could have destroyed Pharaoh and all the Egyptians right where they stood and let the Hebrews have Egypt to live in. But God works through human beings and through human events. The old saying is that God doesn't call the qualified, God qualifies the called. God warned Moses that it was not going to come easily because pharaohs don't give up their free labor without a fierce fight. 
Last week, Noel talked with us about how God is in the messes of life. God worked in and through Jacob, even though much of his life was characterized by qualities that we don't look up to. He cheated, he schemed, he lied against family members. This week, I think we have to take off the lenses that we've been brought up to wear, which flavor how we understand this story in order to fully see the mess that's going on here. Because those lenses show us a simplistic story of a good man, Moses, doing battle against an evil empire in Egypt. Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader, it's a simple thing. What do we see without those lenses? On the one side, we see the Egyptians who had been the preeminent civilization in the Mediterranean for the better part of 2,000 years. Education, medicine, farming, shipping, building, the pyramids, the temples, the Valley of the Kings, they were all there. They'd been around 1,700 years longer than our country has. They had very good reason to believe in Egyptian exceptionalism. And it was a long accepted fact for them that it was natural to use minorities and outsiders to do the hard and dirty work that was below the Egyptians to do and to do so without much reward. On the other side, you have an outsider who was given a place on the privileged inside under the protection of Pharaoh's daughter. He undoubtedly had received an excellent education and was spared the back-breaking labor of his fellow Hebrews. When he was around 40, he observed a slave being beaten by a government overseer and he let his anger get the best of him and killed the overseer. There was no defense for his actions. Slaves didn't have any rights. Dominant cultures are not interested in accusations of government brutality. They just assume it's warranted. The next day, Moses saw two Hebrews fighting with each other, and he asked, why are you hitting each other? You're the same people. You're both Hebrews. They said, are you planning to kill us too? There's no evidence that he had done anything to benefit the Hebrew slaves in the first 40 years of his life. So his actions in killing the Egyptian did not all of a sudden establish his credentials as being their friend. With a police record and a death warrant on his head, no friends on either side, Moses had no option but to leave, and he did for about 40 years. It's easy to see why he didn't want to go back. The old pharaoh was dead, but that didn't mean nobody remembered him and his criminal record. And the slaves certainly weren't, weren't going to receive him as one of them and be eager to participate in civil disobedience just because he told them to. They knew very well the consequences of that. So seen in this light, Moses is a troublemaker. He's trying to stir things up all the time. He's constantly trying to undermine Pharaoh and the status quo. His actions even cause life to become harder for the slaves for a period of time. His demands were an attempt to cripple the economy and the workforce of this model country. Egyptians who had known him from before would call him unpatriotic. Hebrews would question his motives and his reliability. And in all of this mess, God was at work. I wonder if we would have seen it. God gave Moses the gifts he would need to get through it and not give up and ultimately be successful. It seems to me that for those of us in this room, if we're honest with ourselves, we probably need to identify with the Egyptians in this story. We might find things to complain about, but we're pretty comfortable. We're in the dominant ruling class. The status quo is pretty good for us. Most of us don't know what it's like to be walking around our neighborhood and be picked up by a police car for looking suspicious. We don't know what it's like to be asked to show our green card to prove that it's okay for us to be here. 
don't have any qualms about paying minimum wage or less for minorities to cut our yards or clean our houses or pick up our trash or put on our roofs. Our America is pretty good, and we're not really interested in hearing anyone tell us that it's not that way for everybody. I, and maybe you as well, have been watching the PBS documentaries on the Vietnam War, and I think they should be required viewing for every American. It explains so much about how we've gotten to where we are today in terms of division, mistrust of government and leaders and each other, and differing ideas of what patriotism is all about. It gives the opportunity to listen to the stories and motivations of people who are not like us, people who've made very different decisions, and to understand them better, and that's always a critical need. And it gives us the opportunity to learn from the past rather than continuing to make the same mistakes. Well, you remember how this part of the story of Moses ends. Only after the tenth plague, the one where all the firstborn of Egypt die, does Pharaoh tell Moses to take the people and go. But even then, even after paying that terrible price, he's ultimately not able to let go of all that cheap labor. He sends the greatest army in the world to bring them back. The Hebrew slaves watch and listen in terror with their backs to the sea as the chariots come thundering down on them. Moses says, relax. God's got this. You don't have to do anything. The way through the sea opens up. People pass through before the waters close in and swallow up that great army. God provided in a stunning and shocking way. Next week, we're going to move to the other side of that sea where the wilderness journey begins. The dangers and the challenges in that part of the story are very different, but they're very real. Central in the story is going to be the way God provided daily bread for the Hebrews in the form of manna. That would have been a good story for today on World Communion Sunday, but the other one was too. It's got the whole world in its hands, not just us, people on the other side of town, people on the other side of the country, people on the other side of the world. It's got all of us in its hands. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us continue to worship God as stewards of what we have been given by God as we present his tithes and our offerings.
God, in gratitude for your presence in our lives, your gifts in our lives, your greatness in the world, we offer these gifts to you. We ask that you'll multiply them and use them for the work of your kingdom. We ask that you will accept our lives as well and use us in the service of your kingdom also. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this holy feast, united in ministry in every place, as this bread is Christ's body for us. Send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught his gathered disciples to pray like this. Our, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and our power, and the glory forever. Amen. On this World Communion Sunday, we remember that people from north, south, east, and west throughout the world will be gathering at tables. They look very different. They have different types of bread and different looking people gather around them, but all are children of God, and we are all united in the body of Christ. As you receive the elements today, we invite you to partake of the bread as you receive it to remind you that you have a personal relationship with God and that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior. But to hold the cup until all have been served and then we will partake of it together. And as you do so, think about our being the body of Christ together and think about those people around the world in very different circumstances who will also be taking the cup and remembering that they are a part of the worldwide body of Jesus Christ. On the day that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body. It's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup And gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this, too, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving Lord, his death, until he comes again in glory. And indeed, he will. So come, the table has been set, and the meal is ready.
blood of Christ, which is shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Drink ye all of it. Let us pray. O God, who brought powerless slaves out of a powerful country by your power alone, and led them through the wilderness to a promised land, we who are weary pilgrims through a troubled land ask your continued guidance in our lives that you will guide and direct our steps and bring us through this troubled land to your promised land. We thank you for this meal which represents for us <clears throat> the saving love of Jesus Christ and salvation offered for us. We thank you for his willingness to do this for us. We thank you for all that it assures us about his life on this earth, his willingness to die for us, his being raised in power by you to defeat the powers of sin and death, and the fact that he prepares a place for us now in your kingdom where we will gather around the table with people from north, south, east, and west, but most importantly, those who are dearest and nearest to us. Sustain us with these promises, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.